let's talk about since we talk about the future of uh, of, of of Homo sapiens and humans as a multiplanetary species, we need to reproduce in space. We need to have mm -hmm. babies in space. Yeah. Uh, we need to grow our population in space. Of course, not initially, but somewhere down the line, I would suspect, uh, when you have uh, more stable bases, maybe not on the moon, but on Mars, uh, which would be decades away. So how do we, can we reproduce in space? <laughs> Is it possible? I mean, that's some yeah, that's the million dollar question. And uh, the short answer is further studies are needed. Has anyone tried? Uh, the official party line is no. Um, there are rumors out there um, because uh, they're both on the Russian, on the Soviet side and on, on the um, US side. Uh, Mark Lee and Jan Davis famously or infamously were an astronaut couple that ended up going up on a uh, shuttle mission together um, because they didn't tell anyone they were married because it was against the rules for astronauts to fly together. Um, so they married in secret and then went on a shuttle mission together. Um, but the in, in interviews, once it was discovered, like they, they very firmly reiterate, they were on opposite shifts. They were on opposite 12 hour shifts. So they never really saw each other um, over the, the mission. So to our knowledge, nothing has happened in space, but we know there's a plethora of zebrafish, jellyfish, a quail egg, rat, mice studies out there that at best say that the data is conflicting. Um, and so remember, when we talk about reproduction and we talk about intercourse in space, like it's a very um, multifaceted topic. It's everything from the psychology of interpersonal relations to um, the physicality of how bodily fluids accumulate in the zero G environment. Because remember, um, without one G, um, fluids can glob together. So that has implications for um, intercourse. Um, then we have to talk about gamete production and um, you know what sperm uh, motility is like in um, space. Um, we have to talk about uh, female um, fertility in space. And even there, the data is extraordinarily limited because only 12% of women to, to date have, uh, of astronauts to date have been women. Have been women um, yes. And most women opt for oral contraceptives for period suppression. Um, so we don't know what the menstrual cycle yeah. really does in yeah. space. Our data is very limited. Um, and then so now we have to talk about, say we've overcome all those hurdles. What does yeah. em, uh, implantation and embryo um, development look like? What does... Uh, yeah. um, How does the fetus develop? Exactly. And I, I guess these are, these, are, these are questions that I suppose would be answered when you get to it. Well... Kind of. Um, that's one approach to take. But, you know, myself and some of my research colleagues very firmly believe in doing this ethically uh, in a very um, cautious fashion because um, there's so much at stake here. Um, at the big picture, you know, humanity's longevity in the stars is at stake here. Um, yeah. And in the, in the short term, we're talking about an individual child's life, right? And, yeah. you know, say someone just took the leap and said, I not only want to conceive, but I also want to gestate off Earth. We don't have that data. What if the we have conflicting data that the neuromuscular development of rats is altered, but it's transient, so there may or may not be effects. But say we inflicted that on a child who had no say um, on their neurodevelopment and say it had deleterious effects um, for um, height development, for bone, uh, bone density development, for... Um, behavioral and neuro, uh, neuro uh, development, all of that matters. And so that's why um, I'm such a proponent about doing this in a stepwise, nuanced and ethical fashion. And what would that be? Um, I think it involves advancing towards um, not just insect and um, uh, mammalian studies. So some mammalian studies have been done, but also um, the ethics for primate studies would be critical. Uh, there is a ban on that. Uh, I know in the early days of spaceflight, we did uh, experiment on chimps, and now rightly so for ethical reasons, uh, with, without, um, except in extenuating circumstances, it's just not done. Um, but I think this would be a very strong case in which we did look at primate research um, to be able to um, educate ourselves as to how reproduction and development occur off world. Is it, is it gonna take us decades? or perhaps centuries to go from Homo sapien to Homo galacticus? 
That's a really good question. And it's one that's really hard to answer because the nature of exponential change is that by the time we realize that change is coming, we're already about five steps behind. So when we talk about AI is the way of the future, we need to start thinking about ethical protections. When we start thinking about 3D printing, um, when we talk about um, the computing power and the processing power of, mic of, of chips, of computer chips, like we're already in that exponential um, change. And so when we talk about access to space, we already are at that inflection point. However, um, we also need to be mindful of the future that we want and how to create it. Um, and then also be mindful that some things aren't exponential. And by that, I mean generational change. So say that we did have um, successfully have a human couple gestate and um, give birth to the first off-world human. And say they looked fine, um, and maybe at the microscopic level, they were minute but insignificant, inconsequential changes in their DNA. Um, maybe it would be fine for the first generation, but say as we had more off-world right. uh, generations, maybe those changes are cumulative. And by the time that we reach um, you know, generation four or five, um, decades, centuries down the road, maybe that they're so divergent from humanity that it's essentially a sister species. So, you know, this is now we're getting to the realm of sci fi. Um, but yeah. it's important to be mindful well, of the land of unintended. I mean, so much of so much of what, what's around us today was sci fi till very recently. Yeah. Yeah. Even smartphones, yeah, so. you look in, you look in um, science fiction and they, there's these concepts of having portable computers with us everywhere that you can answer any question on any whim. And, Essentially, that's what our smartphones have become. So, you know, we are living in that sci-fi future. We just need to wield it responsibly. Is this purely a, an evolutionary biology problem? Uh, you've also spoken about AI. So could it be that AI is involved uh, in some sort of symbiosis with AI and, um, and robotics is where uh, our sister species would evolve to? It's a, it's a biological challenge, it's an economic challenge, it's a political challenge. So um, I think, uh, and not in that order, I think the humanity's fate in the stars um, for now rests in political will. It changes a little bit with the rise of commercial space, which is kind of promising. Um, and then coming back to the fundamental question of what does the future look like? Technology will be key. Um, because we're sending humans to one of the most austere environments that humanity has ever known. And so um, we need to ask ourselves, how do we not just survive, but thrive on that environment through technology when it comes to uh, communication, when it comes to operations, when it comes to decision making. And I think as machine learning and AI gets better uh, and more reliable and um, less um, error prone, uh, AI will be critical for monitoring, detection, uh, decision making, um, as well as uh, early warnings um, as to the health of our infrastructure, the health of our astronauts, um, the overall uh, probability of mission uh, success, um, and also offering useful interventions. So there is definitely, um, this it really is the past year and past two years have been incredibly fruitful for AI with ChatGPT, um, with the rise of AI, with its applications for for medicine, for for science, for engineering, um, for for the internet age. So um, to hmm. be determined where we end up, but there's a lot of promise right now. So we've we already have uh, had robots on on the ISS. Uh, these are not AI enabled. Uh, we've had the Astro B. I'm, I'm just going to pull up a video of that. They're cute little cuboidal robots. Um, they've evolved very rapidly over the past few years. What happens when you add AI to these uh, to these robots? Um, do we need to evolve ourselves sufficiently, or can we outsource a lot of work uh, to to not only robots like Astro B, but also perhaps um, Tesla's Optimus robot? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I did my undergraduate work in neuroscience and focused my honors thesis on consciousness. And we're, we're kind of delving into the realm of philosophical right now. But one of the questions about mind and consciousness is that without sensors, without senses, you awaken in a room, but you have no sense of touch, smell, 
um, sight, taste, or sound. Um, without that, like, can you, are you even really conscious? Um, so when we talk about evolving the capabilities of um, AIs towards being a true, true intelligence, a super intelligence, it, the question is what types of senses are we enabling them with? Because even right now, um, I wouldn't trust an AI with something that entailed my life. So such as driving or piloting or medicine, um, because the context isn't there and the errors that AI has made um, have been scary. Um, so this is dated and probably doesn't apply anymore. But when IBM debuted Watson, initially for medicine and then finally on Jeopardy, yeah. uh, Watson famously lost by suggesting Toronto was the capital of Canada, uh, which of course it isn't. Um, and so then when we talk about enabling AI, um, taking away, stepping away from the technical term, like the technical discussion, I think it needs to be, well, AI, the technical part is we need to enable an AI with all of the same senses and more that a human might have um, to be able to fully comprehend and contextualize and understand its environment. Um, and then also understand that, you know, what are we, what are the pitfalls? What are the dangers and how do we protect against those? Um, and then we can start generating uh, and working towards AI in a truly productive fashion. And um, when we, when we contextualize and when we uh, enable AI with also a fail safe with recognizing critical errors and how to avoid those and how to um, recognize and decrease the rate of critical errors, then we can start talking about integrating AI um, and making it more independent, which of course is another philosophical question. Should AI be uh, independent of humans? Um, and what is the worst that can happen? We should certainly be asking ourselves that the whole way. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of directions in which AI can go, um, but we need to be asking ourselves hard questions the entire way. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, our tree own uh, brain has evolved from a lizard brain uh, because of uh, <laughs> evolutionary reasons. Um, and if if the AI brain is to evolve, or if um, we evolve together with AI and uh, implants, um, like what uh, again Elon Musk is trying to do, um, it just it raises a lot of ethical questions, as you rightly say. But also, it it's just the promise and potential that lies out there that it offers. This technology offers is. I, I don't know if transformational uh, is the right word, but what it does to our natural cadence of evolution as a species is it puts it on steroids. And there, there are questions not only of the ethical realm, but also the psychological questions of who we are as human beings um, when we are no longer just flesh and blood, but also technology. Absolutely, it does. And it's sort of, you know, it's really interesting because what exactly is a human? If you take take a human and just pile us up on a scale by virtue of our cells, we are more extraneous bacteria from our gut than we are human cells, right? So who are we really? What makes a human? Um, what is the gestalt where that the magic happens that we suddenly have minds and can talk and reflect and interact with one another. There's a lot of mysteries to be solved yet. And I think the future is promising when it comes to studying um, all of that. Yeah, and it's it's also surprising. Um, I, I pulled up the, the, the video from the ISS of uh, the heart cells earlier, and it all it took was a, a shot of electricity to get them beating. Um, so it's it begs the question, what is life and what is that life source? And there's so much to explore and discover, but then we're just going down a, <laughs> a different rabbit hole. And I'm afraid we'll go right down to the Warren if we continue. And we'll leave this for a different discussion when you have the time.